Welcome everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning for some of you guys. Uh, we hope all of you are safe and well, and we are sending our love and thoughts to the people of Ukraine today, as well as the people of Fukushima, because we've just heard that there has been a 7.3 magnitude earthquake um, in Japan at Fukushima today. So we're really, really hoping everybody is safe and well. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us for another European Specialty Tea Association webinar to learn, connect, and inspire tea professionals everywhere. I'm Bernadine Tay, and today I am really pleased to have another real champion of specialty tea. Her name is Anna Poyan, and she is the co-founder of the Global Japanese Tea Association. And just like Esther, the GJTA, if I may call it, is a membership-driven, non-profit, non-governmental organization that aims to spark growth in the Japanese tea world through collaborations. And I am so pleased to say that both our associations will be collaborating in the very near future as well. More about it from David Field, who will uh, say a little bit about it later uh, in the webinar. And uh, we'll be treated tonight by Anna, uh, to an overview of Japanese tea growing and very importantly, its import trends in the European market. Um, just, to, just as a side thing, also they also have a beautiful YouTube channel with loads of interesting content if you want to learn more about Japanese tea. And I'm going to post a link in the chat below later. So I'd love to give you a chance to ask Anna questions as usual, and you can do this by posting it in the Q&A box anytime during the session, and we'll do our best to address your questions at the end. So for the next 35 or 40 minutes, just sit back, relax, sip some tea. Welcome, Anna. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, and before we begin our presentation, I'd like to ask you a key question we ask all our guests. What does specialty tea mean to you, and how would you define it? Hello everyone and thank you for, for having me at this webinar. It's an honor and thank you everyone who's joining. Um, so specialty tea for me personally uh, means uh, tea that has been taken good care of. So with that I mean uh, tea that has been made with passion and love and knowledge. Um, uh, from a tea farmer that cares for the tea plants, the environment where those plants are, um, that puts much effort into harvest production and puts he, his heart into, into making that tea. So that is for me personally. Um, but maybe it's, it's good to mention that uh, specialty tea as such, there's no definition of specialty tea as such in Japan. Uh, in Japan, the situation is a little bit different. Um, there's no differentiation of, uh, like in other countries, some producer would focus either on CTC or high quality tea. Um, in Japan, the average quality is quite high in general. And uh, another difference is that in general, tea producers can make at the same time high quality tea and lower quality tea. And that is because they would do um, maybe high quality from spring harvest, that is the best tea of the year uh, for sencha, gyoko, and matcha. But that doesn't mean um, they wouldn't also make um, common day bancha from other harvest or uh, sencha from later harvest or hojicha or uh, using byproducts from the sorting, for example, for cookie cha, mm -hmm. or uh, the tea dust from, from the production for, for tea bags, or lower quality tea from later harvest for bottle tea. So in most cases, one tea producer can do uh, all, all different kinds of tea. Uh, so just to mention this, curiosity yeah. maybe. No, I, I think that's beautiful. And what we were saying just now is that, you know, all the tea is made with care. I mean, you're drinking a bancha today that is considered low quality, but you love the character uh, of it because it's also very, very special. It's a little bit like art, isn't it? 
Yes, I'm drinking a uh, Kyobanza, it's cold. So it's not very usual, it's, it's mainly done in Kyoto Prefecture. And it's um, a tea that is done at this time of the year from, from leaves that are from the winter. So really coarse leaf and not a, not a prized tea at all. It's a tea drank from the farmers or for everyday use, but still I think it's a very nice tea, very pleasant. That's really, really wonderful. Well, Anna, I will, uh, I will love you to uh, start your presentation. I think everyone's in for a treat. And uh, when you're finished, we will take questions from the floor. So feel free to sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Let me just share it. Can you see it well? Yes, um, very yes, well. Thank you, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so today uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, Japanese tea export trends in the European market. Um, just uh, before focusing on Europe, maybe a little introduction about uh, tea region production in Japan. Uh, this is a map of Japan, you, you all probably know. Um, just to mention that Japan um, um, has different weathers to, uh, through he, its country and tea is grown, we can say up to here, up to Saitama. Uh, northern up is too cold uh, for growing tea, so we might find tea, but there would be probably um, home tea gardens. Uh, the tea production is from Saitama all the way south uh, to the south of Japan to Kagoshima, but also is not in the map to, um, uh, to Okinawa. Um, and the, the prefectures uh, highlighted in green are the most important ones for tea production in terms of um, uh, quantity of tea. Um, so here from this graph, for example, we can see uh, the amount of tea produced from each prefecture. And um, at the top, Shizuoka, uh, she's, she's the biggest, it, it's the biggest producer followed by Kagoshima. Um, but actually everywhere from Saitama South, we can find tea in Japan. It's just that um, many, many areas don't produce high quantities. So um, these are the main ones. And uh, just to mention that um, very often abroad, probably uh, when we think of Japanese tea, we think of matcha or sencha, maybe gyokuro. Um, but even if uh, Japan focuses mainly on green teas, uh, among the green teas, there's still diversity. So each prefecture has its own uh, methods, um, each area is different, each uh, tea town is different, each tea farmer uh, can make a different tea. Uh, so even if we talk of the same uh, tea kinds, um, we have quite a big diversity. Terroir is very important and, and everything around the tea um, makes a difference. So um, I wanted to share just, just to show a bit of um, um, uh, aesthetic difference uh, from place to place. I'll just mention four places. One is uh, Shizuoka Prefecture, probably uh, one of the most common images of Japanese tea um, abroad is uh, tea fields uh, from Shizuoka overlooking Mount Fuji. Uh, this is a very famous site for, for Japanese tea, and this is in Shizuoka Prefecture. Um, Kagoshima, that is mainly flat lands. It has some, uh, some hillside like Hiroshima, but it's mainly flat lands overlooking the ocean, the very south of Japan. And its peculiarity is that stands right in front of a volcano, an active volcano, Sakurajima, whose uh, ashes um, fell on the soil where tea is grown. So those ashes are an important nutrient for the tea and that contribute to the taste of the tea. Um, 
Kyoto Prefecture um, is not uh, very big in um, cultivated land, but is very, very important, a very important place for Japanese tea uh, because of culture and tradition. And because it's one of the first places where tea uh, was first grown in Japan. So despite not having a high quantity produced, uh, Kyoto usually focus a lot on, on quality and has been like that since, since the beginning of tea cultivation in Japan. Uh, here in the picture, you can see um, some tea fields in the town of Huazuka, close to Uji, and is um, quite hilly and um, not at all flat. And here, Saitama Prefecture, uh, the one um, more most northern prefecture that grows tea and also very close to Tokyo. So um, that's one of the challenges, big challenges that Saitama has uh, is right by a big, um, a big, big city and there's less and less space for tea. Uh, why did I mention this for? Because uh, our new project, um, focuses on these four prefectures. Uh, we are really exciting, uh, excited to, um, to work on this new project. Uh, we are doing, um, let's say a YouTube channel um, about these four uh, prefectures. Uh, we are doing the, we are working on the footage uh, right now and in the next months. And um, it will be, um, an informative but also beautiful footage of each prefecture. Um, we will give a lot of information about tea in each prefecture. Uh, on each prefecture, we will go and look at five areas and meet five tea farmers for each place. So a little bit like the Japanese tea marathon of last summer, but uh, not live. It will be a recorded channel and Probably it will be uh, shown to our members in summer and then to the open public in autumn. Uh, we, are, we are really, really looking forward to that. Um, regarding um, tea production by kind, uh, Japan, Japan focuses mainly on green tea. So the 97% of, of tea produced in Japan is green and the most common is sencha. You can see from this graph, sencha is more than, than half of the tea in Japan. Um, but we know that lately matcha, for example, has become very, very popular abroad. Um, yet we can see from this graph that matcha production is still very tiny in Japan. It is um, only 4%, so quite, uh, quite curious. And all the other teas are in the other section, so a very um, small percentages, percentage that includes uh, any other kind of tea that is not green. But um, if we um, come to Europe and have a look here, uh, did you actually know that we Europeans were the first uh, people outside Japan to try uh, Japanese tea. Um, Japanese tea was um, for the first time exported in 1610 um, for, um, by the Dutch East India Company. And the tea um, went out from Nagasaki Prefecture. So in, in the south of Japan, uh, the tea from Nagasaki was exported at the time uh, all the way to the Netherlands. And if we um, jump to more recent years, um, we've seen that recently Japanese tea has been growing more and more popular in Europe. Um, more and more people is interested um, in Japanese tea. Uh, more and more people has knowledge about Japanese tea and is passionate about Japanese tea. So that is uh, quite encouraging and, and beautiful to see. Um, in, in 2020, uh, Japan exported over 5,000 tons of tea. 
and uh, 647 tons, so the 12% of it, uh, went to Europe. It might seem a small number, um, it might seem a small percentage. Um, the, the majority of the tea exported from Japan goes to the States and other countries. Um, but still, um, it's, it's a really good number because it has been growing in the past years quite substantially. So um, it seems that there's uh, more and more interest in Europe and growing. And if we look at the Japanese tea exports to Europe in, in the past few years, we can see that from 2010, uh, there's a big increase. Um, we see a decrease uh, from 2019 to 2020. So from 693 tons to 647 tons in, in 2020. But um, we, we are not sure about it and why um, that happened, but uh, we can probably say that the uh, COVID pandemic affected that. Um, maybe the harm consumption in tea during COVID didn't decrease, but um, um, there have been many issues with shipping, uh, especially with Japan Post in COVID. It shuts down, as Alexis reminded me um, yesterday. And uh, it is, well, it's shut down again now. So Japan Post had, had a bit, ha, has been a, quite a big issue during COVID pandemic. So uh, we guess that that didn't help at all to, to import tea to Europe. Um, if, you, if we look more in detail um, at, um, at each country in Europe, um, well, we have a long list, but the five uh, largest uh, Japanese tea importers in Europe are Germany, France, the Netherlands, the UK, and Italy. Um, Germany is uh, the biggest by far, you can see, but uh, Germany is also a bit different because Germany is uh, sort of the tea hub in Europe, is where all the tea uh, well, not all, but uh, the vast majority of the tea imports come into Europe uh, to then be, be sold to, to other uh, European countries. So we, um, from the association, we don't have uh, the numbers of how much Japanese tea then goes out from Germany to other countries, but we can say that Germany is, is of the biggest importers. And both Germany and France in 2020 decreased a bit. Uh, um, nevertheless, the Netherlands, the UK and Italy uh, increased the imports of, of Japanese tea in 2020. And um, we've seen all this um, interest in, in Japanese tea growing. And well, Japanese tea is not completely new um, in Europe. And in the past few years, the fascination has definitely been growing, but there are still, um, we can say some issues with, with um, many uh, tea shops in Europe, unfortunately. Many times um, we see there's lack of information about tea from Japan or um, lack of correct information. And very often uh, there's a bit of difficult um, access to access to good tea. So um, of the main issues we, we usually found, find, uh, one is the origin. Very often we see uh, Sencha being sold in tea shops, but then if we look at the origin, we find uh, that comes from China and not from Japan, and very often it's not even central, it looks more like Bancha. The other big issue is quality, unfortunately. Um, many times the quality is low, and here in the picture, this is a picture I took a few months ago just at my local supermarket. I guess in the UK is a little bit better, the situation with matcha, but where I live in Spain and uh, in Italy or other countries, um, 
very often the matzah we can find is um, of, let's say, poor quality. You can see in this photo, the color is, is terrible. It almost looks like flour and very often is sold in, in uh, transparent containers and the origin is not even marked. Um, so sometimes it's not even all tea inside. Um, that's, that's a bit of an issue. And matcha is not, unfortunately, is not a protected um, um, trademark, let's say. So uh, yeah, anything can be sold as matcha. Um, the other big issue is, big is bad storage. We've seen many times um, green tea sold in, in stored in big containers. So in big containers, uh, air easily comes in and oxidizes quickly the tea. So that is bad, especially for green tea and um, stored in glass or plastic transparent uh, containers, sometimes at the tea shop windows. Uh, so the storage is really important for, for green tea, especially well for all teas. And um, a bad storage can completely ruin the tea, even if the tea was originally high in quality, it can completely ruin the tea. But not everything is bad, of course. Um, there are some very, very good uh, tea shops around Europe uh, selling pure and often single origin uh, tea, including tea from Japan, very good tea from Japan. Uh, just a few examples. I'm sure we all know here uh, Postcard Teas in London, um, Neo Tea in Paris. Here in the photo, uh, you can see Matsusan, one of our co founders, when he visited the shop. Um, Paper and Tea in Berlin, here in the picture, two of our members, um, and many other shops uh, around Europe. In Spain, we have the Teren, Calchai, in Italy, La Finestra Sul Terre, and La Tellera Eclectica, and many others. So, um, not everything, of course, is, is bad. There are many good places. And impressively, some shops even uh, specialize specifically on Japanese tea. Um, just to mention a few, uh, Jugetsudo in Paris, and in London, there's Katsute and Keiko in Germany. And actually Keiko even has um, its own stone mills to, um, to grind matcha directly um, in Germany. And I think there's more and more interest growing in, in, in the matcha grinders. Um, so matcha can be um, ground in the country where, where it's gonna be sold. And this can preserve the freshness uh, of the matcha, especially important with matcha. Um, at the same time, we, we also find other um, new, new uh, cafes that use tea for, uh, for Japanese desserts or lattes. I think matcha latte is very popular everywhere now. And hojicha latte is becoming a bit more known in Europe as well. Uh, in Japan has been popular for, for a long time now, uh, but now hojicha is also um, um, found in Europe in, in a few places. Um, so um, after mentioning all this, um, despite still finding uh, some issues with Japanese tea in Europe, we, um, we think there has been much improvement in, in recent years. And uh, we mentioned earlier uh, that there has been a decrease in, in the imports of Japanese tea into Europe from 2019 to 2020. One issue could be uh, the COVID and the shipping uh, problems uh, due to COVID pandemic. Um, but uh, one important thing, um, thing to, to say is that while the exports, the tea exports to Europe decreased in volume, 
uh, they actually increased in value. They increased by 139,000 yen. Um, and that's um, a very good sign because from that we can, we can deduct that higher quality tea is being exported to the, EU, to the EU compared to previous years. And if we go and look a little bit more in specific to the type of tea uh, exports, um, we see that in Europe, uh, Japan exports more loose leaf tea, uh, 60, um, 66%. Um, compared to, um, to, to powder tea. And with powder tea, we, um, uh, we mean matcha uh, or uh, hojicha powder or other uh, powder teas, not, not, not uh, dust for, for tea bags. Um, but if we compare uh, the EU, for example, with the US, that is the biggest importer of, of Japanese tea, um, the US, on the contrary, um, imports more powder tea. Um, and if we look at the value instead of the, of the quantity, um, in the US, the, the proportion is correspondent to its volume. So the value is um, correspondent to, to uh, to the amount, uh, while in the EU, uh, the imports, um, um, the value um, imported of powder tea is much higher. And uh, that is quite significant because we can, with that, uh, we can understand that uh, the powder tea imported is more expensive. Therefore, um, the powder tea imported is of a higher quality. Uh, then Europeans, uh, we, we guess they, they ask more for uh, ceremonial matcha, high quality matcha rather than cooking matcha or uh, a better quality cooking matcha. Um, um, yeah, we, there are different qualities of, of cooking matcha as well. So probably the ones imported are uh, the vast majority of a better quality. Um, and that's promising. And then another thing, while um, again, while the exports decreased in volume um, in 2020, the exports of organic tea to Europe have increased. Uh, so 86.6% um, of the Japanese tea imported to Europe is organic, a huge amount. Um, the, the European Union, uh, I'm not sure about the, the UK, but I guess it's similar, um, has already a strong um, pesticide regulation. So even for conventional tea, um, the, the limit stated of pesticides uh, allowed to be used uh, for, for the tea that has to be imported um, is already low compared to other countries. So that's already something good. But um, additionally to this, it seems that uh, people in Europe are really pushing um, for organic tea. The demand for organic is more and more. And this uh, really has an effect on, um, on, on the producing country in Japan. So um, in Japan, organic production has not been, um, uh, well, has been the, the minority in tea. So most of the tea uh, grown in Japan was done conventionally and not organically, but more and more tea farmers are, um, are uh, switching to organic. Uh, either for health reasons or uh, for more um, care of the environment. And uh, seeing that there's more and more demand of organic tea from abroad, uh, that encourages um, tea farmers to switch to organic. And actually, um, in, in Shizuoka Prefecture, uh, the government is giving some, some funds for tea farmers that want to change to organic production because they see there's um, a better possibility for, for exports. 
So why is it so encouraging and so positive for us that uh, Japanese tea is in much more demand in the EU? Um, for this, we need to have a look uh, to Japan. Um, in Japan, tea has been part of, of the culture for, for centuries. Um, and in, in many places, especially in, in tea regions, of course, um, tea is served as welcome drink at home or in restaurants. If we, if we go to um, many places in Kyoto Prefecture, if you go to a restaurant, to a restaurant, hoji cha is usually offered as a complimentary drink instead of water as a free drink. Uh, so it is part, it has been part of everyday life, but in the past few years, this um, has been changing. Um, tea in Japan has over 800 years of um, production history. And um, around a, um, 1868, uh, Japanese tea was uh, the second largest uh, exported item after silk from Japan. And after that, Japanese tea production grew gradually until reaching its very peak in the late 70s with over um, um, 100,000 tons per year. So quite a lot. But what happened after that? Um, in more recent years, uh, Japanese tea production has been declining and, and in very uh, recent years quite drastically. Uh, if we look at uh, 2018, in 2018 the total uh, of the production was almost 85,000 tons. Um, it dropped um, to not even 80,000 in 2019. And in 2020, we can see here, uh, the total of the production was 69,800. So the decrease in production is quite um, important, is quite worrying. And that, is, um, that happens uh, because of different reasons. One is the aging uh, tea farmers population. Uh, the average uh, of the tea farmers uh, population age is, um, uh, let's say, quite old. So once uh, a tea farmer retires, nowadays, um, in very few cases, there's somebody um, taking over the tea fields and, and following his steps. So usually in Japan, um, Tea, um, tea farming was uh, a family, a family tradition. Uh, so the, the new generations would pick up what the older generations have done and, and keep on uh, working in tea. Um, it's not the same nowadays, it's not the same situation. Uh, we see that in the past 20 years from 2000 to 2020, um, out of five tea farmers, uh, four no longer make tea. And this is very sad. Um, they no longer make tea because either they are tired and nobody is taking over or uh, because they don't think it's worth it anymore. And nobody's taking over also because they think it's not worth it anymore because the price, um, the market price for the tea um, is decreasing quite a lot. So um, already uh, being a tea farmer in Japan, uh, if you're a tea farmer in Japan, you, you wouldn't get rich uh, for sure. But in, in late years, in, in recent years, it, it is also um, becoming a difficulty to, um, to meet months end. So it's, this is quite uh, serious and sad. Um, at the same time, uh, we, see, we see the production declining here um, in green, but we also see that the Japanese tea exports are increasing. So that's, uh, that's the, the hope we have. Um, we can see it is not much, but 
only 15 years ago, only 1% of, of all the production of Japanese tea was exported, while now it amounts to a 8%. So it's a little increase, it's not huge numbers, but still um, is quite, um, it is growing exponentially compared to before. So that's, that's a good sign. Um, another problem that affects Japanese tea production is that Japanese tea, unfortunately, in Japan has been seen as something old fashioned in, in the past few years. So um, until a few decades ago, um, the domestic market was large enough. The demand for, for tea in Japan uh, was enough. Um, many people would drink uh, tea daily. So that was enough. Tea producers, tea companies didn't have to focus on exports. Um, but lately, the things have been changing. Um, less and less people drink loose leaf tea, less and less people prepare tea at home. Um, not many people even have a, a teapot at home nowadays. And there's also the challenge of other beverages. Uh, coffee, uh, Japan is, is a huge consumer of coffee and specialty coffee, and then bottled tea. So it's not that people is not uh, drinking tea anymore, but uh, most of the people, what is drinking is bottled tea, not loose leaf tea. Uh, so the habits of consumption have changed. It's not that bottled tea in Japan is something bad because it's still, um, in most of the cases, uh, only tea uh, with no, with nothing added to it. But of course, the tea used to make bottled tea is of a lower quality. And uh, if, if the demand for bottled tea uh, is growing uh, quite exponentially, um, the the prices uh, for for kilo of tea are decreasing. So that also affects the production because tea farmers are sort of pushed away from um, focusing on high quality tea. If the price is very low for high quality tea, of course they cannot afford to focus on that and they would either quit or um, decide to focus more on low quality production for bottled tea or supermarket tea. Um, we can see an example here from um, Shizuoka Prefecture. So this is a graph with a change of prices for um, the first harvest of tea. So the first harvest, the, the spring harvest is the, the best harvest of the year, the best tea of the year, the highest quality. The tea that has a more complex aroma and taste and rich in components and everybody's looking forward to it. Um, we can see this graph uh, showing um, first flash prices in Shizuoka Prefecture and how much it dropped. This is the average price among different, the different uh, types of tea, of green tea. Um, so we can see that from uh, 2010, it really dropped. And uh, we don't see it in the graph, but uh, for example, Gyokuro, especially Gyokuro is um, usually the most expensive uh, tea in Japan. And uh, for a kilo of Gyokuro in Shizuoka in 2019, um, uh, costed uh, nearly 5,000 yen, while in 2020, a year after, it, it, it didn't even make to 3,000 yen. So the drop was quite uh, severe. Um, and this, uh, brings us to, to the Global Japanese Tea Association. All these reasons is what made us establish the Global Japanese Tea Association and decided to, to work on it. Um, we hope that uh, spreading Japanese tea really around the whole world 
and making more and more people um, grow interest in Japanese tea, like more Japanese tea, learn more about Japanese tea. We hope that doing that um, is of uh, some help for the Japanese tea industry to survive. And um, through really a global collaboration, this would give a new life to Japanese tea. Um, the association was um, uh, is founded on three pillars. One is information. We, we want to spread uh, correct and updated information about Japanese tea and what happens in the tea sector in Japan. Uh, the other is education. We do different courses about Japanese tea. And the other is community. Um, because we, we really uh, want to connect uh, all the people that have tea in common from tea shops, uh, tea producers, uh, tea sellers, um, tea farmers, and tea lovers and tea consumers. Um, the, the courses we offer are, um, of course, focused on Japanese tea. We have three different type of courses. One is the foundation course that gives the basis on Japanese tea. The other is the intermediate to go a little bit more in depth. And the third one is the master course. So the foundation and the intermediate, we have been doing that online for the past two years since, since COVID pandemic. Unfortunately, we haven't been uh, able to do it live until now. Uh, actually this month, um, the, our friends from the Tea Circle in Belgium, they are starting, uh, they will start to give uh, our Japanese Tea Foundation course uh, live in person in, in Brussels in three different languages. So if you are in Belgium and you're interested, um, go check it out. Uh, the intermediate course is still only online. And the master course is on hold at the moment uh, since travel restrictions uh, because it's an in-depth course, a full immersion in Japanese tea in Japan. And we really believe it has to be done um, in person and in Japan because it includes different experiences with tea, visiting tea farms, tea farmers, tea factories, uh, tea auction, experiencing uh, Chado tea ceremony, Saint Chado tea ceremony, and everything you can experience about tea in two weeks in Japan. So we hope um, borders restrictions will ease up a bit and, and to start again with these courses. And then we've been doing um, Japanese tea events online, the Japanese tea marathon. Uh, maybe some of you that are here tonight participated uh, last summer. It was really exciting. And you can actually still find the videos for free on our YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't watched it, uh, go and have a look. Are really interesting and, and nice and fun to watch. Um, it is a little bit of a uh, a travel, an online travel through 15 different tea regions of Japan. And the Meet the Tea Farmer events, we are doing it uh, now, uh, nowadays, once per month, we meet online a tea farmer that uh, offers two of his teas to the participants and have tea together um, and talk about his teas and ask questions. And then our membership program, you can have a look. And yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, please join us. Um, let's, uh, let's share Japanese tea together. Let's drink tea together. And uh, in this way, maybe we can, we can energize um, Japanese tea and give uh, a new life to Japanese tea together. Thank you. Oh, Anna, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We've got so many great comments from uh, the, the, the audience uh, showing their appreciation for the knowledge that you have shared um, on the Japanese tea industry. Fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so before I go to questions, I just want to ask a, a couple of my own, if I may. So do you think um, matcha was actually the catalyst for Europeans to appreciate and explore Japanese tea? 
would you say matcha was the catalyst? Um, it can be in some cases, because uh, matcha is probably um, a big attraction, even uh, from, from uh, just its appearance. It's a powder tea, so it's something different. And it's bright green, and it's used in, in sweets, in cooking, in lattes, in lots of different things. So it's something different. I think that is something that attracts easily the people. And then uh, there's lots of uh, claims about health benefits of matcha. So that I think is also what is uh, drawing people towards, um, towards tea in general, I think, and matcha in particular. So I would say, uh, yes, I would say yes, then, then matcha is sort of the, um, the entrance kind of to, to Japanese tea maybe in, in Europe. Indeed, okay. And, um, you know, how do the Japanese, this is actually Alexis's question. Alexis, would you like to ask it actually, your question about matcha? <laughs> okay, don't worry, I can ask it for you. I'll ask it for Alexis. Alexis. So Alexis wanted to know whether, um, you know, Japanese matcha producers. How do you feel about, uh, you know, Europe being invaded by matcha imitations? As you detail uh, this, and are, are the Japanese producers aware of this? Um, yes, they are aware. They are aware of this. Um, I I couldn't really answer for the producers. Uh, how do they feel? But. I think uh, the demand at the moment is, is quite high compared to the actual production in Japan. Uh, we saw at the beginning, matcha is just a 4% of the total tea production in Japan. So I think it couldn't, um, it couldn't make up for the, for the big demand around the world mm -hmm. anyway. But um, more definitely, more tea farmers are focusing uh, on matcha, on producing matcha, and more tea regions that didn't use to uh, produce matcha are um, moving towards matcha. So yeah, they they are they are there's awareness of that, of course. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, matcha is not a, a protected. Um, Tea, let's say so. Um, matcha can be sold as matcha coming from anywhere in the world or under any conditions. Even if in Japan it is clear what matcha has to be and how it has to be made, but mm -hmm. there's no regulation. So um, yeah, I, I couldn't really answer for the producers themselves, but there's definitely they are aware and. Um, that's that's why um, that that's why they want to increase the exports of Japanese tea. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, just because we're on the topic of matcha, uh, there's a question that has come in from Melina, and uh, she asks: Apart from the matcha trend, have you been able to notice new trends emerging in Japanese tea consumption recently in Europe? I think hojicha powder definitely. Um, has has um, been growing and um, something that until just very few years ago was not known and more and more people is discovering hojicha powder. Um, another thing maybe is uh, somehow bancha and kukicha. I think in macrobiotics and for health reasons, people think uh, kukicha and bancha is is better for health, even if that's um, well, that's not always the case, and it depends. But somehow um, we see that's a little bit of of trend. It seems. In, oh, that's interesting. So just just on that topic, is it uh, what is it about bancha and kukicha? Is it gut health or higher antioxidants? Um, Honestly, um, I don't know why this, this started. Uh, I know that in macrobiotics, uh, usually um, teas that are milder and lower in caffeine are suggested. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I've seen claims of uh, yeah, high in antioxidants and other um, health properties that not always correspond to bancha and, and cookie chan. Um, the teas with uh, the biggest amount of, of, of nutrients and components and properties are in general the spring, uh, the spring teas, essential yoku and matcha, but those also have high amount in caffeine mm. and stimulants. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's just <laughs> I suppose when you're looking for a, a, a bit of marketing in there, yeah. Yeah, no, indeed. Okay, so I'm going to the questions posted in the Q&A now. Um, I have a few from Vincent. Um, so he asks, is tea covered by the EU-Japan free trade agreement? Uh, can you say again, is tea? Yeah, sure. Uh, is tea covered by the, sorry, one second. Is tea covered by the EU-Japan free trade agreement? I oh I I wouldn't know I'm afraid I would have to to look up at that. Okay. Sorry. And is and is uh, Switzerland in your statistics when yes. you were covering? Okay. Um, and then last from Vincent is has the value of the yen have any effect on trade? So from uh, one euro to uh, one hundred and thirty five Japanese yen to one euro to 117 Japanese yen? Uh, if it has any effect on, on the export to Europe, I guess yes. it means. Um, mm, I guess it's complex because it, it can have effect, of course, if, if um, the euro is stronger in value compared to the yen, that would be more beneficial to Europeans, but um it is not so simple i think because uh, also the original price in the in japan has been um changing and it has been declining it has been um dropping so i think that makes uh more of an impact compared to the uh to the currency exchange i see uh, okay, and then another question about price from, from Ajit. Uh, he asks, has the price of Japanese tea dropped within Japan to the same level as the general average? He's just wondering if the push into export markets is damaging the price the most. Um, no, export. Uh, so the exports are... Um, the, there's a push to exports because actually the, the price is dropping in Japan. So um, they see that the, sell, the sales of Japanese tea in Japan are not so good. Not many people consume uh, loose leaf tea in Japan and uh, that makes the price go down. So in consequence of that, um, um, Japanese tea producers and tea companies, they try to export more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question now from Marjolein. Uh, where do you see the most hope for growth for the Japanese tea industry? Uh, do, you mean, uh, do you mean in which country? Um, perhaps, maybe if you, if, if you have, have an answer to that. I think, uh, as my opinion, I think Europe is promising because um, it seems that uh, from Europe, we look for better quality um, and um, people is learning more and more and it seems is demanding better quality and the demand for organic tea sort of shows um, more um, a kind of a care for what you buy, uh, for what um, a person buys, for the products they, they buy. So I think uh, Europe is promising because um, high quality tea uh, can be the thing uh, compared to other places. And then uh, Taiwan has interest in Japanese tea, but uh, maybe not uh, 
such uh, high quality maybe as in Europe, um, and then Taiwan has its own steels. So, um, well, that's an interesting question, but definitely Europe is promising. I don't know if she meant countries or regions or something else. Okay, but uh, uh, Marjolene, if you want to, I hope that answers your question. If you um, want more clarification, please feel free to uh, send us uh, in the in the box. But uh, you know, so besides the language barrier, um, what are other inhibitors, you know, of Japanese tea export to Europe? Then, and how can you help tea companies wanting to bring in Japanese tea into into Europe? Um, that's um, that's a big issue. We we have been working and discussing since the association started. Um, the language, of course, is one big barrier. But another thing is that um, Japanese tea companies were not used to export, so um, many they have to start from zero. They they were used to sell in Japan. That's one thing. And then another thing to consider is that very often tea farmers, um, the situation in Japan, the general situation is still that tea farmers sell their teas at auction. And then from the auction goes to tea companies and from the tea companies, they, they, are, they would sell uh, in Japan or abroad or whatever. And um, I think the, the ideal situation would be uh, a more direct trade, so as direct as possible with the tea farmer. But the problem is that a tea farmer, and usually in Japan, uh, um, tea farms are a family, a small family business in general. So they don't have the means to focus on on many times on marketing or se on selling the tea and on exports even more. Okay. They, they have work enough with uh, tea cultivation and tea production. And that is um, all their time is taking there and efforts is taking there. So if, uh, if a tea producer wants to export, they have to do marketing, they have to speak another language, they have to do much paperwork for, for exports. Um, sometimes they have to, to pass sanitary inspections, a lot of paperwork. So very often tea farmers uh, and small tea companies can't uh, dedicate their time or efforts or resources on that. Yeah. That is maybe um, a big issue. And we've been um, trying to think what's, what's the best um, way we could help, but we still can't come up with a solution. Uh, what we think uh, is that... Um, uh, the ideal thing are uh, tea, um, tea exporters that would uh, buy the tea from the tea farmers or help the tea farmers in exporting the tea. Mm -hmm. um, and people that would speak other languages than Japanese and Japanese. So that's the ideal situation probably. Um, there are some people doing that and some people doing a very good job, but the demand is way higher of, of the quantity of people doing it. So there's space for, for yeah. more people to, um, to import Japanese tea. Okay. Well, I'll ask uh, you a question uh, from Ahmed because it, it's kind of related to this. Um, he's, ask, he's saying that I'm planning to open a tea house and I'm interested in Japanese teas which are almost unknown in Saudi Arabia. Only matcha can be seen in the supermarket. And my question is regarding documentations required for food, uh, tea, which most high quality uh, small farms cannot provide. How can one overcome this? Do you have any advice for Ahmed? Um, so one problem is that uh, the small farms that uh, couldn't, uh, that cannot do the paperwork maybe, and the other is that uh, there are some regulations at the national level. So uh, Japan has uh, different regulations for each country exporting uh, the tea. Uh, for example, for uh, sanitary, um, how, 
how do you call it, sanitary paperwork, phytosanitary uh, inspection paperwork. Yeah, so at the like national, yes, at the national level, there's already uh, a regulation. It's not that a tea farmer can decide by himself or a tea producer or a tea company. There's also national regulations that say to which country they can issue those certificates and to, to which count. So that's another problem. Um, but yeah, uh, there would be need to, to look in specific for, uh, he said from Saudi Arabia, right? That's right, correct. You know, there's a bit of difficulty in that area, <laughs> in that region. Uh, I think we had some difficulties with some of our members, but if, if he wants um, information in more specific or if he wants to get in touch with people already maybe selling to his region, he can send us an email. And if we can, we, we can try to help. Oh, that's perfect. Um, fantastic. Okay, so uh, I have a question from Angela. Um, she says, uh, nowadays Japan is becoming extremely popular in Europe, especially due to its soft power. Do you think that this is going to influence the amount of Japanese tea that is exported to Europe? Does it have an impact? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> If people is more interested in, in the culture of a country, well, uh, tea is a, a strong part of Japanese tea culture and maybe especially the tea ceremonies is something yeah. more uh, that has a stronger um, cultural meaning. So I hope that um, tea will become more popular if, if people are more interested in Japanese culture. Indeed. Indeed. I'm rushing through a little bit only because you have some really amazing questions that I'm going to um, uh, ask you from the floor. Okay, so Kimberly asks, what, what would you say is the best way that people outside of Japan can help to bring more attention to Japanese tea and help to boost export numbers going forward? So probably share tea with people. Um, keep on drinking Japanese tea and share with, with friends that don't drink tea and try to offer tea and, and involve people in, in, in drinking more Japanese tea. And I know this is difficult for, because uh, for me in Spain and in Italy, it's extremely difficult to make people <laughs> even taste some tea um, sometimes. Uh, people want coffee and wine and other drinks, but tea is very difficult. But um, I think uh, still it is something we, we have to keep trying and, and sharing tea and offering tea. Indeed. I think maybe there's an opportunity also because Japanese tea has such a unique flavor profile, especially its beautiful green varieties, perhaps maybe to uh, pair with food in, in you know, um, restaurants and, you know, the unique present unique and modern ways of presenting Japanese tea might just help to boost interest, you know, very much like fine wine. Definitely. I think in the restaurant uh, sector in hospitality, uh, tea is still not very much, um, uh, how do you say, used as, yep. as it could be. So yep, the opportunity is much, huge there. Yes, much potential. Okay, next question by Dr. Sazie. Um, thank you so much, she says, for your perfect presentation. Um, she's from Turkey. During one of my visits to Japan, my Japanese colleagues gifted me a set of matcha products of various quality and price sold in their domestic market. Could you please explain whether this uh, huge difference in quality and price is due to the raw material or the production method? Uh, so the short answer is both. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the high quality for matcha is determined um, by uh, the cultivation, um, a tea, very short a tea uh, to be processed uh, then later into matcha. The tea plants have to be shaded for four weeks. Um, so that's uh, one requirement. And if the harvest is of spring, the first harvest, if those leaves are used for matcha, uh, the, the bud and two or three leaves are used for matcha, that is the highest quality. Mm -hmm. So that is usually the highest quality for, for drinking matcha 
in Japan. And inside that uh, quality, inside the spring uh, harvest, uh, we find also different qualities. There are, um, so uh, tea comes from one plant, but inside one plant, there are different varietals. And some varietals are preferred to others, some are sweeter, some are more bitter than others, some are more green in color. So the varietal also determines um, the quality and, and therefore the price. And uh, I guess uh, the region, the place where, where it's uh, produced and uh, the, the harvest, if, if it's hand-picked will be more, uh, more expensive, even if it's not so common to have hand-picked tea in Japan, uh, if it is hand-picked is more expensive and uh, how it is processed, of course. Um, so everything determines the quality. And then uh, there's another quality that is um, cooking matcha, culinary matcha or for confectionery. It depends of which later harvest um, the leaves are used and uh, if there's still shading, because supposedly there, uh, there has to be shading, but not always if it's a very late harvest, so. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, okay, next one again from Ajit. Do you see much innovation in Japanese tea production industry, such as better black teas, white teas, or even flavored teas? Uh, many of the hospitality environments we sell tea into um, do not want to serve Japanese tea in the Japanese way, but in a Western style due to speed of service, this does not allow people to taste the beauty of Japanese tea. And I was wondering if there is any innovation being looked at that could provide consumers with a true Japanese taste, tea taste, but with the speed of Western hospitality environment. This is a good question, Ajit. It is a good question, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, there's always a lot of innovation in Japan and, and trying with tea. So um, on one hand, there are, we mentioned the vast majority of tea produced in Japan is green, but more and more farmers are experimenting with different teas. So there's uh, a lot of attention to Japanese black tea lately. Um, there are some farmers starting to try with white tea, for example. Uh, so yeah, there are different teas uh, and farmers experimenting with different teas, but also innovations. Um, I've seen, for example, uh, uh, bottle matcha, uh, a bottle, a plastic bottle with water and a capsule of matcha in it, and you would shake it, the capsule would break and the matcha would go into the water. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a quick way to, to drink a matcha, for example, or um, I can't recall now, but um, yeah, there are, there are definitely always innovation and experimenting. Um, what about for serving, you know, uh, in, in an operational uh, situation in hospitality for loose leaf Japanese tea? Is there a known way in Japan that, you know, you can do it really, really quickly, but still preserve its character? So maybe one thing that comes to mind that I think is becoming popular in Europe are, for example, the, those Hario brewers. Um, oh yes fear brewers where um you can brew the tea there so i guess it's more handy rather than a kyusu if somebody doesn't want to uh, lose time and then um what else i can't think now yeah. it's okay if it comes to you because there um, there's always would... something new <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Next question, um, and I'm sorry, I hope everybody doesn't mind. We go, uh, there's some really beautiful questions coming. Um, so we're just going to over just a little bit today. Uh, Alexandra has asked, out of curiosity, any particular reason Germany is the highest consumption of Japanese teas within Europe? My guess it's because Germany is actually one of the great, uh, biggest importer of teas in general, isn't it? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, Germany is one of the biggest importers uh, for tea. Uh, I think Hamburg is probably the place where 
most of the tea comes uh, through uh, Europe. Uh, so that's that's basically the reason. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Vincent asks, is Russia a big customer of Japanese teas? Uh, I don't remember the, the numbers. I would have to look it up. Um, I, I remember it, it was increasing. So, but I can't remember how big it is. I would have to look it up. Um, I don't know if it's possible to to reply later on in the next. Sure. Thing. If if you could if you could give us the response, we will post it on our social media, and perhaps um, uh, then everybody can uh, Vincent, you can see the answer, but but everyone could know as well. Yes. Uh, oh, and we have a comment by Soren Biscard, who I understand is a tea master, a ceremonial tea master. And uh, he says it, it is important that the European importer has much knowledge of Japanese tea and can educate the consumers on how to prepare the teas and appreciate them. So that's a comment from him. Um, and then Juliette, uh, as a French consumer, I find it disappointing that some retailers or shops sell average quality Japanese teas at a very expensive price that doesn't seem justified. Now, it seems to me that such behaviors can make consumers reluctant to buy those teas, especially if the tasting experience isn't great. What do you think about that? I agree. I completely agree. Um, I, I get quite annoyed myself sometimes when I see uh, prices of not such high quality tea and I know what the prices are in Japan. So when I see uh, some things here, um, I get quite annoyed. Um, I know that importing tea is not, uh, is not easy and for tea shops is not easy, but uh, sometimes uh, the prices are inflated compared to what we get uh, as customers. As consumers, so especially with matcha, I've seen that with matcha a lot. Um, or I was mentioning earlier on the trend of cookie cha and bancha, uh, because it seems it's healthy. Uh, I've seen really high prices for um, some roasted cookie cha that in Japan is considered is still a good tea, but is considered um, a low price tea. So that's not justified. Is something we we can't really. I mean, it's not our place to control that. There's nobody that can uh, control that. But maybe as as consumers, um, um, the people that know about Japanese tea and and know uh, what's a good quality Japanese tea, are the ones that maybe can complain directly to the shop. And <laughs> Indeed. I think I think at the end of the day, education is key, isn't it? If you yes. know, you know, and, and you're familiar with what you're buying, you can buy better, you can be more uh, savvy in buying from the right places and also create relationships with uh, tea companies that are doing it right and doing it Definitely. fairly. Definitely. Sometimes it's not even fault of the, the tea shop where you see the teas. Um, so, yeah, definitely education is, is the key. Okay, I have a last question that I'm going to put to you from Francesca. And uh, she asks, what can we do to support farmers buying their products besides asking specialty shops for quality Japanese teas? Buying directly from them is difficult and very expensive because of shipping and duties. Yes, uh, so, well, I think, I think demanding to shops is one thing and maybe... Um, if buying directly is difficult, trying to buy from um, uh, good sources, from, from people that import good quality or from uh, Japan, from, from tea companies that export um, tea from different farmers. We, um, we usually recommend a few that we know of. Um, people are welcome to write us and ask us and we would recommend a few. Super. Anna, thank you very, very much for uh, your time and, you know, the lovely, lovely insights. Um, I think everyone uh, um, enjoyed it and you've got a lot of lovely comments in the chat. 
Uh, I just wanted to, before, you know, I tell everybody about the next webinar that we have that's going to be equally as interesting. I'd just like to hand over the floor to uh, David Veal, um, our Executive Director of ESTA, just to talk a little bit about the partnerships with my CAF with you. Is that okay? Over to you, David. Okay, thank you, Bernadine. And thank you very much, Anna, for a really, really interesting and stimulating presentation there. I've noticed that uh, and we have a number of new attendees on the uh, on this webinar, so thank you for drawing uh, new people into us. Uh, and if you are, uh, to all of those of you who are here for the first time, uh, a big welcome to you. So yes, as Bernadine said, um, I'm really pleased to be able to say that um, uh, our two associations are now just in the final stages of uh, negotiating a partnership agreement whereby we will uh, um, commit ourselves to work together to support one another, to promote one another and to work in specific ways. Uh, actually, many of them based on those three pillars that the Tanner just talk, talked about, which is um, sharing information um, and, and also um, sharing benefits. Uh, Anna mentioned education there as an example, and also working together on events to um, promote uh, our, our uh, activities and promote, help to promote Japanese tea uh, in Europe. So we're really looking forward to uh, uh, working closely together in the future with our, our Japanese uh, friends and, and colleagues. Just on one of the small note, we, we can also announce that we've, uh, we now have our own um, in-house blogger who's going to be blogging for us on a regular basis. Uh, it's Kimberly Kay, who's with us this evening uh, as an attendee. Uh, she blogs mainly on Japanese um, uh, issues um, and the first blog which she's going to do for us is covering the topic one of the topics which Anna just talked about which is the problem and challenge of uh, aging farmers in Japan so watch out for that on our social media and uh, on our uh, website also uh, thank you back to you Bernie. okay no it's Yes, thank you so much also to everybody who's taken the time to ask questions and, you know, to engage with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, I really hope you join us for the next webinar. We do this every month if you're new to us uh, with interesting topics that uh, cover tea, botanicals. Um, and if you have any suggestions also that you'd like to uh, uh, see, please feel free to send us an email. But for next month, which is happening on the 13th of April, we're going to be discussing the many flavors and functions of the honey bush plant. Now, many of you um, who have uh, 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 tasted honey bush, you'll know that it's kind of like the cousin of the Roy Bosch tea plant. And we will be uh, talking to Daniel Fiore, who is a, a regenerative agricultural specialist. So that's going to be really, really interesting. So please do join us on the 13th of April. And uh, the European Specialty Tea Association, we exist uh, to raise standards of tea everywhere. We do this by embracing innovation, sharing knowledge through events like this, and encourage collaborations like what we're doing with the Global Japanese Tea Association. And our aim is to improve every cup of tea that is served and to make sure that uh, our producers get a fair price for their efforts and to keep making tea better. We are not-for-profit organization and consist of wonderful volunteers from all over the world to bring great content, education programs and events. And to do this, we would love people to join us as members as well. So we really appreciate your support. Um, we have different packages for individuals and businesses, but to know more, please visit us at, at excuse me, visit us at specialtyeurope.org. Um, but for today, I want to thank you. Dot com, sorry, thank you. I think it's getting a bit late. Um, <laughs> but thank you so, so much, Anna, for all your, your insights. And I want to thank you everyone as well for staying with us and for all your support. And for today, I'd like to say good night. I hope to see you next month. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much, Anna. Bye. Bye, David. Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank you.